Hi everyone, my name is Agustin and today's lecture is about uh, planar graph duality. So let's get started and let's see what is planar graph duality. Well, first of all, um, let's, let's see what's a planar graph. I'm assuming everyone knows what a graph is, but let's talk about a planar graph. Well, a planar graph is just a graph that can be drawn on the plane, on the 2D plane, without intersections. Um, more precisely, without two lines, two edges of the graph intersecting in the drawing. So this would be a pretty simple uh, planar graph. This would also be a planar graph. Um, now, one of the first um, things that we might want to be careful about is to make sure that we take into account the difference between a planar graph and um, a planar embedding of a graph. Well, a planar embedding is just the same as a drawing, basically. It's the, like the technical name of, of the drawing is an embedding. This is an embedding of the, this graph on the plane. Um, an embedding requires that the edges do not cross. So for example, this would not count as a planar embedding of the complete graph of five nodes um, because the edges are crossing right here, for example. This, for example, um, would not be a valid uh, embedding of this graph that is complete except for one edge. Um, but nevertheless, the graph itself is planar because we say that a graph is planar if there exists an embedding of that graph um, in the plane. So this one is planar because if we draw it differently, um, we can draw it, we, we can actually draw it in the plane without um, having the edges cross. We can do it like this. Um, this one is connected to all others. This one connects to all others and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine edges. Um, so we're only missing uh, one of all the edges. I think, uh, yeah, I think we're missing this one and there's basically no way to, to add that without crossing. So this shows that the full graph of five nodes, the complete graph except uh, for one edge is planar because it can be drawn this way. The same might be said of the complete graph of four nodes. This is not a planar embedding of the complete graph of four nodes, but the complete graph of four nodes is planar because an embedding exists. This would, for example, be a different draw drawing of the, um, of the complete graph of four nodes that is an actual planar drawing. There are no crossings, so it is a valid embedding. Now, this might seem like a pretty moot point and not important at all, but it is because a single planar graph uh, can have multiple actually different, actually non-isomorphic um, embeddings. Let me show you an example. Now, here we have, for example, a nice example where um, the same graph is drawn in two uh, fundamentally different ways. We will soon come back and, and check that these two drawings are f essentially different and quite uh, different. Um, here I, I painted one of the, the nodes, this, this, this central node um, yellow, just to, to make it easier to check that they are the same graph. Uh, simply one central node and like uh, three triangles attached to this special vertex. Um, that's the same in both cases, so these two uh, graphs are isomorphic, um, but the drawings are quite different. We, we will soon come back and check. Now we're in a position to define the dual embedding, the dual drawing of um, one specific um, embedding. So for example, here we have one uh, previous example of a drawing, an embedding of a planar graph. 
Um, for this particular embedding, we can create a dual graph. Um, in some problem, one might be interested not in the vertices themselves. For example, the vertices might be uh, posts and these uh, lines are fences running um, between the posts. And we're interested in the regions of the plane that are um, divided by these uh, fences, right? That might be a, a valid story. Um, so if we're interested in these regions and which uh, are, are adjacent to which ones, um, we might be uh, interested in defining a new graph. I will uh, mark it like this with one node per region. We're interested in the graph of the regions um, of the drawings, um, and I and I will include uh, I will always include uh, this external infinite region outside the, the drawing. Um, that might not be important in one problem. We we could remove it, but it's uh, part of the the, the, the typical. Uh, dual graph. So the dual graph is this, the graph uh, made by the regions. And for each edge in the original graph, we will put one edge in the dual graph um, between the two um, regions that are connected by that edge. So um, for example, if, if one might think that each edge is a wall, in the plane, and so it has two sides: the the upper side, let's say, and the lower side in this in in this particular edge example. And each side uh, touches one region. Um, so the idea is to connect um, those two regions. And thus, the dual graph always has exactly one edge for each edge of the original graph. It, um, it sort of uh, turns the edges or changes it, but it uh, keeps a, exactly the same number of edges. And that means that very often, like in this example, the dual graph will be a multigraph. It will have um, more than one uh, pair of edges between the same pair of nodes. Um, in some problems, most often that is not important. And I am drawing it like this, making the the edges that I am drawing in the dual graph cross like this, cross the actual edges that they correspond to, to, to emphasize that um, this new graph that I am creating is actually a planar embedding of um, uh, the, the dual graph. So the dual graph is always planar. If you have one particular planar embedding of a graph, uh, using this technique that I am describing, you get, you immediately get a planar embedding of this uh, dual graph, right? So the dual graph is planar, and another important property is that it is always connected, um, because intuitively, since it um, it has one node per region and it connects two regions when they are um, neighbors, um, well. You can, <laughs> for any two points in the plane, say I want to go from this region to this region, I can I can just draw a curve, it doesn't matter, and well I can check when, what regions I am crossing through through that curve. Well, you have to go from this region to this region because I crossed here, okay, and then from this region to this region because I crossed here, okay. But and by tracing that path, I can always go from any region to any other region. So even if the original graph was um, not connected, the, the dual graph will always be connected. Um, so that's very intuitive. And a very important property is that um, the dual graph depends on the planar embedding. That's a very important property. So different embeddings of the same graph can lead to different dual graphs. So the dual graph is not unique for a given graph. It might depend on the embedding. So it, it is actually um, more correct. It's proper to speak of the dual of an embedding, actually. You can speak precisely of the dual of a given drawing, like this. I have this particular drawing here, then this is the dual graph. But if I had a different drawing, for the, even for, for the same connections, let's say, it might lead to an essentially different dual graph. And let's check with this example that we had here. Um, in the left case, I can draw the, the dual graph and we see that we have um, four regions 
and the connections um, are basically like this. I, I will I will skip the multiple edges here so that it is clear. There are three connections between this one and the exterior regions. Then um, let's say that this is the node. There are also three edges, this, this, and this, connecting the exterior region to this region. And then also three edges connecting uh, this one to this one. But apart from the multiple edges, this is just a simple path. That's the dual graph. While on the right example, uh, it's quite different. We have the exterior region. We, we also have three regions. Um, but it is a star, it is a tree. It is no longer a simple path. So the same graph can have um, non-isomorphic dual graphs depending on the drawing. Yes. Fortunately, when we have a problem and a planar graph, we are often given the drawing and those that um, defines the regions and how they, con they connect in, in, a, in a single clear way. But it is nevertheless important to take into account that um, the dual graph is not unique, unless of course we are concentrating on one specific drawing. Now, you might rightly ask, um, why is it called the dual graph? Why, why is it dual? Dual to what? Um, well, th there is um, a very nice property. Um, let's check with this example that we've used before. Uh, just uh, by looking at it carefully, we can check that the dual graph of the dual graph is actually the original graph. So they are both dual to each other. If we concentrate on these nodes, the, the ones that I described before as the dual graph of the original, um, and we think of them as, as the original graph, we can check that these white nodes are now located strategically one per region. You can, you can check it by carefully looking at, at the drawing. There is exactly one per region. And the edges, like I said before, are like like uh, turned. They they change they they change the direction somewhat. They are like ninety degrees here if you if you look, but um, there are still edges. So regions become uh, regions in one of the two uh, graphs become vertices in the other one, and vice versa. It's both ways. So that is why it is called the dual graph. Uh, this is only true if the original graph is connected, because remember, we, we know that um, the dual graph is always connected. Um, so, for example, if we have uh, this graph not connected and made of two triangles, well, the dual graph will, will, never be, um, will always be connected. So, in this case, it will be like this. Um, I mean, what do I mean by the proper drawing? This embedding where I explicitly show that it is planar, like this. Um, and now if we check what is the dual graph of this new uh, green one, it is not exactly the red one because we have this duplicated node. Um, the exterior region sort of merges um, all the different uh, connected components of the original one. And uh, those th we can think of this as, as a single node. It's, I, can, I can make this like, okay, this is a, a fat node. And that's it. I've, I've fixed it. Um, so yeah, now uh, we can speak of the... <laughs> now this pair is actually a dual pair. Uh, it, it, the red one is the dual uh, drawing of the green one, and, and the green one is the dual of the red one. Uh, but before it was connected, uh, we, we cannot really say so, because applying the dual and, and the dual again, we get a connected graph, so it's not the original. It, it has been merged. Um, but apart from that case, when the when a graph is connected, then it's the dual of its dual is again the same graph. We will come back to grid example later, but I want to emphasize now that um, duality is especially nice for grids because, except for the exterior region which connects to to many others, um, it's like a one fat node. Let's say almost everywhere, the dual of a grid is another grid, which is something that I am pretty sure that you problem solvers have already used. Um, when you have grid problems, it is very often uh, convenient to, to think either of the vertices of the grid 
or the cells of the grid themselves. Um, and the, the situation is always the same. You can, in both cases, identify each by carefully choosing indexes x, y, um, and the neighbors of x, y are x minus 1, y, x plus 1, y, um, x, y minus 1, x, y plus 1, etc. It's the same in both cases, no matter whether you're thinking about um, um, corners or regions. So that is a useful example, where the dual is like almost the same and also a nice grid. One very interesting um, idea that I've never used in a problem, but I don't know, maybe one problem setter takes this idea and uses it, um, is that what happens if um, the graph is, say, a directed planar graph? Is the dual also directed? Um, well, it's not common. The most common case is the undirected one, and all of this lecture will be about the undirected case. Um, but let me tell you that there is a way to consistently and in a useful way define the dual for the directed case. And like I said before, uh, if you make this careful drawing, an edge and its dual edge meet at 90 degrees. So you can actually take a convention um, to say uh, always clockwise or always anti-clockwise um, rotate the edge, and that defines the, di the direction that the edge should have uh, in the dual. So, for example, let's say that we make this yellow graph as the dual of the white one, which is directed, um, and then we will rotate all edges, uh, say, anti-clockwise. Then uh, this one rotates like this, and those is points this way. Um, this one rotates like this. There, I think that's all. Now, another simple property that I might add is that um, I've been speaking about uh, being able to draw a planar graph on the plane, and uh, it's the, the same class of graphs if you, instead of plane, say sphere. The graphs that you can draw in a sphere are exactly the planar graphs. It's the same. So drawable in the sphere or drawable in the plane is the same. That might be useful to think sometimes. Um, for example, historically, um, Many of the properties of planar graphs were discovered by studying um, convex polyhedrons, and that is closer to a sphere, actually, because you can sort of inflate the polyhedron and draw it in a sphere. Um, and well, um, that is why they, they are also the properties of the planar graphs. Now, I have not mentioned it yet, but it is very well known, so you probably already know it, um, one of the most important uh, formulas related to planar graphs is um, Euler's formula, which um, basically relates the number of uh, vertices and edges, we typically call it N and M in problems, um, with the re number of regions and the number of connected components in a graph. Um, typically, the number of connected components C is just one because the graph is connected, and in that case, you will see this formula written as just uh, m plus 2, that is more common. Uh, this is the same as m plus 2 for connected graph. But uh, this is a more complete formula, so it's good to, to have it uh, in mind. I've, I've used this formula in a lot of problems, so it's uh, very useful to know. It, this formula is especially useful um, when you need to, to, to count how many regions there are. Uh, almost every problem that uh, describes a drawing in the plane. Um, it might not give you the graph, but it might des describe a drawing by throwing lines. Then from that drawing, you can f create a graph. Um, and then if you can count the number of nodes, the number of edges, and the number of connected components, which are typically easier to, to count, um, then you can calculate the number of regions using this formula. Um, so it's very useful in that regard. So you must know this formula. Um, I'm just skimming through it, but if you don't know it, um, le learn it. It's important. Using this formula, one can prove that all planar graphs are sparse. That means they don't have too many edges. In fact, a planar graph can have at most 3n minus 6 edges with the caveat that this is for uh, simple graphs, of course. If you allow loops or multiple edges, then you can have as many edges as you want. Now, the truly interesting thing about duality is that 
you don't only um, dualize a graph, you dualize concepts. So one concept in G becomes um, a different concept in the dual of G, which is commonly written like, like this with a star. So that is the truly interesting thing. So let's think, for example, what does a bridge in G become in its complement? Well, a bridge is an edge such that removing it will increase the number of connected components. So we have one connected component here, we have one connected component here. Um, well, actually all of this is a single connected component, but if this edge is a bridge, removing it will disconnect these two parts. Now this might not be the whole graph G, there might be other connected components floating around and if we have a drawing, this might all be surrounded by an outer uh, region and this might float inside um, this region. But no matter what, there will be a region here surrounding all of these current connected component. It might be the outer region of the whole drawing or not, it doesn't matter. And what we can see is that the bridge touches this region in both sides. So when we build the dual graph by putting a node for this region, then we must place an edge for this um, bridge edge, but this edge touches the same region in both sides. So it will just be a loop. Or we can draw it like this. It's a loop. It's an edge from this region for, to itself. And that is a general property. Um, bridges dualize into loops. And this works both ways because remember, at least as long as we um, limit ourselves to connected graphs, the dual of the dual will be um, the original graph. So if the dual of a bridge becomes a loop, then the dual of a loop, it has to become something that when dualized becomes a loop. And we have just learned that bridges have that property. And this is very intuitive. If you have a loop in a graph, then, then the whole loop defines this region inside. There, there might be other things. You might have a more complicated drawing so it might not be the whole thing, but this um, purple area will definitely be a region. And it is clear that the loop is the only edge connecting this purple region to the outside world, let's say, to the, to the region bordering the loop on the outside. So that in fact, it is true that the dual of a loop will become a bridge, and this works both ways. We can, we can say that a graph G has br a bridge if and only if its dual has a loop. So a bridgeless graphs has a loopless dual and vice versa. For those of you um, that are more mathematically inclined, you can see that um, duality is like a machine for creating new um, theorems or new concepts. You can see, you can check a property that you know in G and then apply its dual and see where it lands, see wh what, it, what it says, and that will be a new property. Another example is that of an articulation point. Well, we can make a similar drawing. And for this node to be an articulation point, it means that when removed, different connected components, at least two, remain from what was originally a single connected component. Now, if this is graph G, we will have its dual, and this point in the dual will become a certain region of the plane. And remember that G is the dual's dual. Thus, the original graph encodes the connections between the regions in the dual. So, since removing our vertex disconnects the original graph G, removing the corresponding region in G dual must actually disconnect the dual graph. So, it must disconnect the regions. And it means that this region must have a hole. Because if it didn't, if it was simply connected without holes, then disconnecting it would not stop us from walking around the plane. Thus, the articulation points map exactly to non-simply connected regions in the dual graph. We should note that this is in the sphere. Another interesting example is that of multiple edges among the same pair of nodes, and that maps to multiple edges among regions. This one's pretty straightforward. So in order for the dual graph to not have any kind of these multiple edges, the original graph must avoid having more than one edge among two different regions. So for example, let's say that 
the story of a certain problem describes walls in a city and something like that. And it, it says that um, two, two walls are um, equivalent or something if they divide the same two rooms or the same uh, two areas. Um, well, then we can create an algorithm to detect those uh, special walls by finding multi edges in the dual graph. Now we have said already that um, graph, planar graph duality uh, works um, such that you can translate properties from a graph and apply it to its dual. So if you have a property that holds for any um, connected graph, well, uh, its dual graph is a connected graph. I mean, I mean, for if you have a property that holds for any planar connected graph, then it will also hold for its dual because the dual of a planar connected graph is a planar connected graph. So you can check what the same property means in its dual and that will give you another general property of planar connected graphs. So take, for example, Euler's formula. R, the number of regions, swaps with N, the number of vertices, when you go from a graph to its dual, because vertices become regions and regions become vertices, while M stays the, stays the same. So for the connected case, Euler formula is just N plus R equals M plus 2, and thus, if we swap R with N, we should get another valid formula. And of course, this happens because N and R are symmetric in this formula. You can swap it and it won't change anything. But we now know that it has to be so because of planar graph duality. And similarly with this, we can turn this known um, formula that a planar graph is sparse and has at most 3N minus 6 and use it to create another valid formula for all pl planar connected graphs. Because if we apply it to the dual graph, well, then uh, n becomes r, while well, m doesn't change. So we have that, that the number of edges can't also be too large in terms of the number of regions. It can be at most 3r minus 6. Now, we must remember that this was for a simple graph without loops and without multiple edges. And we know that loops become bridges and multiple edges become multiple edges among regions. So we should qualify that this for formula will only hold in that situation. This formula will hold for all planar connected graphs having no bridges and having no more than one edge between the same pair of regions. Now we can finally get at what I consider to be um, one of the most interesting things of this uh, lecture. Uh, and this is a result that I have used um, many times, at, le at least four or five times uh, in different problems. I, I've seen it in Hacker Cup problems, in Code Jam problems. Um, I've seen it at regional ICPC contests in Latin America. Well, maybe, maybe not the regional contest, but maybe some previous instance before the regionals. Um, I will comment on that. Um, so th this is a very interesting result and, and I've seen it a lot. M maybe not in the general graph case, um, but for a specific graph, but the idea, the idea, I've, I've seen it a lot. So uh, let's suppose that we, have a, that we have a planar network and we want to calculate the max flow or the mean cut. We know that they are both the same. The max flow is the maximum flow that we can send from S to T without exceeding the edges capacity. While the mean cut is basically the minimum cost we have to pay um, by destroying some edges to make sure that it is impossible to send anything from S to T. So we have to disconnect um, S and T by cutting edges and cutting an edge uh, has a cost equal to its capacity. Um, those are basically the max flow and the mean cut problem. They are very well known and there is a very well known theorem that you probably know already that uh, the maximum flow equals the minimum cut in, in, in terms of value. The, the capacity of the minimum cut equals the value of the maximum flow. Um, so this should be, yes, I, I think this is correct. This is a valid um, cut. Uh, cut. By cutting these edges, there is no longer any path uh, from S to T. In fact, we, we could avoid cutting this one. So this would also be a valid um, cut. I don't know if it's minimum. It probably it won't be, but it doesn't matter. It, let's just focus on the idea. Um, well, we want to avoid using um, 
or uh, we want to avoid using a flow algorithm for whatever reason. Um, either it's too expensive or we simply want to find a different way to solve this problem. So um, let's focus on the min cat. After all, if we are after the value, we can we can create reconstruct we can we can both reconstruct the flow and calculate its value from the min cat. So let's focus on the min cat. Let's focus on the min cat problem. Um, what does it mean for a set of edges to be a cut, cutting S from T? Well, in a general abstract graph, um, basically it means that every path from S to T has to go through one of those edges. And it's hard to get um, a better condition for a general graph. But we are in the presence of a planar network, so we can focus on the fact that this is a planar network. So we have a drawing. That means that we have a drawing in the plane and we can use it. Um, we, we Let's assume that we have an actual embedding of our graph. So we have a drawing like this. The, the, um, the min cut and the max flow do not depend on the precise embedding. A different embedding of the same graph would, of course, uh, give the same min cut and the same max flow because um, those these two notions do not depend on the embedding only on the graph but nevertheless we can use the embedding to our advantage why so because intuitively a cut is like um it's like using a, a pair of scissors let's say and actually cutting the edges like like it was paper and we're using uh, a scissor to go continuously from one way to the other, cutting, 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 until we arrive down here. And that way we separate S from T. This is the basic idea and it's a very powerful idea. Wait, let's use a different color. Um, this would be the, the line, so to speak, um, corresponding to, to this cut. And this is a powerful idea because uh, what is this line that represents the cut? Well, this line is no more and no less than basically a path through the regions of the graph because when when, when our scissor goes moves and cuts 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 um well it, it's not interesting when the scissor moves inside the region the only interesting thing is when we go from one region to another one because then we must cut that edge and we must pay its costs in order to cut it. Uh, and now we are inside a different region. And then we, we can go this way, and we are inside this region, and we can go this way, etc. So basically, basically, what we have is that a cut from between S and T is mapping to a path, a certain path, um, from region to region. So, of course, a path between regions, a path uh, going between adjacent regions uh, is no other than a path in the dual graph. If we had actually drawn the dual graph, let's say I use these white triangles to mean the nodes of the dual graph, then we are basically, we are basically um, tracing a path from this part up here to this part down here. And then our final conclusion is that the problem of min cut dualizes and transforms into a min path problem. We can use, for example, Dijkstra's algorithm to solve um, this minimum path problem in the dual graph, which would have order n log n, um, which is probably better than most of the standard um, graph flow algorithms. So that, that could be an improvement. This is the main powerful idea. A min cut, whenever we have a max flow or a min cut, because we can calculate both of them, um, in a planar graph, then we can instead calculate minimum paths. And minimum path algorithms are uh, usually uh, simpler or faster. Now, this intuition is quite clear, but we must be very careful of what exactly do we mean by a path in the dual graph. Particularly, we have the outer region twice here, so this should be only a single node in the dual graph. If we actually make it a single node, we can see that the path of our scissors 
actually it's more like a cycle. We start at the outer region and we end up again in the outer region. But we have cut a cycle out of the plane and the key idea is that this cycle um, goes around S but not around T or vice versa, both, both options would work. By creating such a cycle, it is impossible to go from S to T without escaping the cycle. And that very intuitively justifies why it is actually a cut. And the cost of the cut is of course the cost of all the edges we had to go through. Then things are not as easy as compute the dual graph and then find a cycle passing through this special outer region. Because then, I don't know, we could go with a cycle like this, 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 this. And of course, this doesn't work. Uh, cutting these three edges is not a cut from S to T. Be and that is because this uh, cycle does not enclose S nor T. It doesn't enclose neither of them. It has to enclose exactly one of them in order to separate them. So we have a problem. We can't use the dual graph exactly as is. So we must make a slight modification to make sure that um, this cycle or this path that we're looking for actually separates S from T. And there's actually a pretty clever solution. This infinite outer region can be separated into two parts. Basically, since we want to separate S from T, we can trace this um, sort of separation. Since we want to separate S from T, we can use them to separate the upper outer region which is above, let's say, S and T, and the lower region, which is below S and T anyway, let's say here. Then we can make these two separate nodes for the outer region in the dual graph, but taking into account this uh, special uh, frontier that we've uh, invented. The idea is that the cycle that we were looking at before would be completed by going through this special frontier that we've made. And those our path that we will be looking for is the other part of the cycle, so it will not be allowed to cross this separation. Thus, when we actually construct the dual graph, this upper part will only have edges crossing into this upper part too, but it will not have edges like this. This edge will correspond to the other half, so to speak, of the outer region. Now then, when we look for a path between this node and this node, we will actually find a cut from S to T. I would like to emphasize too that um, duality can be used both ways whenever that is useful. Um, for example, I remember um, a local SCPC contest in Bolivia, I think it is um, uploading at SPOG, where a certain problem described um, a planar network, just like the one I, I draw. It says, okay, you have uh, something like this, a network, and, and it will be given in the input. The input will give you all the coordinates X, Y of each point and the connections. The connections are through straight lines in this case. and what you know is, I, I, like, I remember there was like these two lines because uh, in the story this was the westernmost point S and this was the easternmost point uh, T. And this was like blocked. And actually your mission was to cross from one side to the other and this were fences. And, and each fence, uh, I, I, th I think there, was, there were no costs so we could use BFS. Um, I, I believe they, they all were worth one, but it doesn't matter. If they had a cost, then use Dijkstra. Um, and the idea was you have to cross from the north to the south, basically. You have to cross uh, these fences and you want to cross as few fences as possible. So it is exactly the same problem as before. But the way that this is one is stated, um, the way that this problem has been stated, um, we, we are never asked um, to find a flow or a cut from S to T. We are only f asked to find a path from between the regions, uh, crossing as few regions as possible um, from the north to the south. So we are explicitly told to find a path in the dual graph. Thus, we can solve this problem by first 
construct the dual graph and then uh, run BFS or Dijkstra or whatever. But let's suppose that you don't know how to construct the dual graph. It, it is not uh, particularly hard, at least for the most common connected case, like this one, the connected version would be suffice. Um, but nevertheless, even though it is not um, hard, it is not very well known. So maybe you look at this problem and say, oh, wow, I have to construct the dual graph. I, I've never done that before. I'm, I'm not used to it. Um, what's, what can I do? Well, thanks to the duality that we found, um, if we're asked to find this mean path, we can actually look for the mean cut or the max flow because that's the same. So um, we can just uh, copy paste from our team notebook, or maybe you've actually used flow already in the contest somewhere. So you can copy paste uh, from another file that you have that's even faster and uh, just run max flow from S to T, even though the problems uh, just ask for how to cross from North to South. And it's a simple uh, path problem, explicitly talking about a path. You say, I don't care. I know that the mean cut will be the same because this is planar network. Um, and thus, I will just run max flow from S to T and return that as the answer. And uh, that is a, a very nice solution. Um, I think it has a worse complexity, but I remember that this problem had a, a pretty low bounds, like N was 100 or something like that. And, and thus, uh, that was okay. It was okay. You 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 could uh, pay uh, a max flow, and it was simpler because you don't have to construct uh, the dual graph. And um, I mean, it, the algorithm is probably harder because the max flow algorithm is harder. But if you take this as I can just copy paste it, then it's simpler because you 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 even don't have to use the the x y coordinates of the points here because you probably will use them to construct the dual graph. But you if, if you're only using the connections. Uh, then you don't care where the, the points are. You only care which are connected to which. Um, so I, I found that to be a, a very nice uh, problem and, and an example of, of this idea. In that case, in reverse, but nevertheless, it, it's the same. It, it's a nice example of the idea. Now, this cutting of um, the outer region into two uh, up and down parts might, um, might feel slightly um, specific and, and not general, uh, so, okay, let, let's tackle that. Um, what, what do we do in general? What do we do? I, I mean, can, can we only uh, tackle a problem when we, like this in a planar network, when the when S and T are part of the outer region and we always have to divide it in the upper part and the lower part like this? Well, more or less, it doesn't actually have to be the outer region, but the simple case, which is the one I've almost always seen, I, I haven't I think I don't remember uh, seeing the the general case of max flow in a planar network in a programming contest yet. But the easy case that we've been solving without knowing it is that when S and T are on the boundary of a single region R. Note that S and T are in the boundary of many regions possibly. Maybe here we have R1, R2, R3, etc. But it doesn't matter as long as there is at least one region R which has both T and S in the boundary, then we will be able by the same technique um, to compute uh, the mean cut between S and T by uh, calculating a minimum path in the dual graph. So how we, do we do that? Well, the idea is the same. I have not drawn the rest of the graph, but you can imagine there are many more things. And the idea, just like before, is that we're going to cut, cut, cut with our scissors. And our mission is to create a cycle that encloses T and does not enclose S or vice versa. It's, it's the same. So how do we force our movement in the dual graph such that when we close the cycle, we know that we have enclosed exactly one of S and T? Well, like before, we have to divide this shared region R. And we divide it into two uh, areas, R1 and R2, using the order of the vertices in the region's boundary as the criteria. So we go, say, clockwise or anti-clockwise, doesn't matter, but we go in order from vertex to vertex, and we start from T and go until S. Then all of these edges that we have seen 
between t when going from T to S would, would basically form part of region R2, while the rest, which we would find if we continue traveling back from S to T, would form the other region. So the only modification that we have to do to the dual graph is that instead of having a single region R here, we will split it into two regions, R1 and R2. And we, and, we want, and we want the cycle that we are building to go through both of them. That's like saying that our line has to cross this original dotted line that I was drawing. Now, by forcing our cycle to cross this line, then you can easily convince yourself by, by, making the, by, by looking at the drawing that any way that you, no matter how complicated, any way that you try to go from R1 to R2 without crossing this um, line again, we create a simple closed curve that has to enclose one of T or S and exactly one. You, you can't avoid it. So the algorithm would be identify the, a region containing both S and T, split that region into two, and the criteria for splitting is just taking the boundary in order and cutting at T and S precisely, and then find a path from one of the region to the other of minimum cost. Um, of course, do not add this edge between uh, regions when looking for the minimum path, because this edge actually did not exist in the original graph. Now, you might rightly ask, but what about the general case? What if there isn't uh, a single candidate clear region containing both S and T? Well, that case is more complicated. Um, the main idea is the same, uh, but um, it's more complex. And I haven't ever uh, seen it yet to appear in a programming contest, so that's good, but maybe one day it appears. Um, it's more uh, theoretical because it's more technical, like, okay, fi fix the, the idea so that it also works. Basically, we have an example here. Uh, these four are the regions uh, touching S, and these three, these two and, and the outer full region, are the ones touching T. And there is no single region touching both, so we can't use our technique. But uh, we can do something similar. Uh, okay, we can take a region um, adjacent to S, a region adjacent to T, and then take uh, one path in the dual graph between those and let's draw it um, so we, we're in this region and we can go um, like this. This will be a very simple path uh, joining them. And well, we can imagine that this path goes actually from S to T, but uh, going through the through the regions that is. So it's in the dual. So it's basically a path in the dual graph um, between a region adjacent to S and a region, a region adjacent to T. That is basically what they have, we have here. Um, so then what do we do with this? Uh, well, like before, the idea the idea is um, always the same. We would like to have a cycle, um, basically in the dual graph, as small as possible, that separates S from T. So the cycle should enclose S and not T or vice versa. It should separate them both. So this cycle does not work. This cycle does not work. This cycle <laughs> does not work. We would need a cycle uh, separating. How do we force? to separate. Well, the idea is the same as before. Um, let, let's see, we, before we had um, a special line here between the regions connecting S and T, and we used a trick of uh, dividing the region in two to make sure that our um, cycle uh, passes through um, that area once. Well, basically, basically you can apply the, the same idea here. The, the path is this one in green, and, and, and thus it is longer. But um, it still works. You can use um, you can use the same idea. Uh, the thing is that you uh, you basically don't know well what happens if the path um, goes. Um, I mean, what? Let's take the the magenta path, the magenta cycle. Well, what happens if the cycle uh, is crosses here? What happens if it crosses here? Well, one one method would be to try them all. But then um, the solution would take time uh, l times n or l times n log n something like that where l is the length of um this path that we're taking as a reference here it is three uh, but i don't know this path might be long so 
the running time becomes uh, like quadratic. Um, that is one option. Once you decide uh, which one, then you can proceed. Basically, you can basically proceed as before. Um, but here you have to divide uh, the whole path. So you would have say R1, R2, R3, R4, like this. You would create copies of all of um, of all of the regions along the path, and then we would find uh, for each of these uh, original regions, well, what happens if it crosses there? Uh, you can check uh, by making drawings and convince yourself that the, the solution to the whole problem is basically the minimum of, well, if I decide that it will cross here, then I find on this new uh, dual graph where, we, where I have splitted each and every one of the regions along the path, um, I will find the mean path between R1 and R2 where of course I am not allowed to, to cross here, right? These, these edges uh, crossing between R3 and R4, between R5 and R6, etc., are not added in the dual graph, just like before. Um, then I find the minimum um, path between R2 and R R1. I find the minimum between R3 and R4, and like this, between each pair. Um, well, you can convince yourself that like before, we have a line and we are going from one side to the other, so we have to split exactly one, and you can convince yourself that the solution has to have this form, so we are not missing it. It is one of these, but we do not know which to take as our start and end, so we have to compute various um, minimum paths. So that's why um, the complexity is worse, but the idea is the same. Um, this solution can be made to run in time uh, n log n, by using a divide and conquer technique. I will I will not go into the details, you can look it up. Uh, it's um, a known algorithm in the literature of planar graph, but basically the idea is that you take the middle point of this path, like you compute, okay, let, let's run one, uh, one mean path for the middle one, and then uh, do not start from, from zero. Uh, recursively calculate for each uh, remaining half of the path uh, using the information you gained uh, from from the first run, that that's the that's the basic uh, idea. Uh, but again, it, it's not so important to go into uh, the details. I, I I don't know all the details my, myself. That the, that's the rough idea. I, I've never have to use uh, more than the the basic one, where this uh, length of the path is actually one. So there is a single region containing both, which is often the the outermost region in the drawing. Um, so, so yeah, just, just, just to let you know that it, it can be done. And um, max flow or min cut in a planar graph can always be solved with the complexity of uh, min path, uh, or, or at least an order n log n. So, great. All of this is very interesting, theor theoretically speaking, but um, I still haven't talked about how to compute the dual graph, given a drawing, given the planar embedding of your graph. Um, and so uh, we, we, can, we can't still use um, any of these, it seems, at, uh, to transform a problem from the given uh, graph um, to a mean path in the dual graph. Uh, to go in that direction, we, we, we still can't uh, use it because we do not know how to compute the actual dual graph. Or can we? Well, I, like I've said, uh, there are some cases in which we do not need to run a general algorithm to compute the dual graph. We basically already know what the dual graph is because of the special uh, shape of our graph, the special structure that our graph has. And the, 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 the prime example, the, 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 the one that shines the most and the easiest to me is in a grid. Because like I said, uh, like, like we have already seen, the dual of a grid is another grid. So that makes things very easy on a grid comparatively. Um, so I will uh, show uh, a real example that I have here. Um, it, it was basically a problem from um, an old Google code jump. Um, it's not identical, but it's very similar, very, very similar. So the, the main idea, you, you can take it the same. So the story is that there is a horde of um, evil orcs or something that are invading from the north. And our homeland is here in the south. And, um, well, th they can't go off the board that we have drawn here, uh, basically, but there is a, an infinite stream uh, of, of orcs coming from the north. And, um, 
well, basically, uh, the orcs will will come and try to get to the to our homeland to invade. But there is a catch. These um, things in green that I have drawn between cells, each each orc uh, goes uh, from cell to cell, walking. Um, but uh, these things, these little things, are like a sort of bridges. Um, and the thing is that the, the orcs are very heavy and very uh, brutal, and, and so when whenever a, an orc crosses a bridge, the bridge is destroyed and can never be used again by any other orc. Um, so that places a limit, even though there is an infinite stream of orcs coming from the north, there is that places a limit on how many can actually reach home. For example, if, if an orc passes like this, well, he's already broken all of these um, bridges, and so another orc will have to use a different path. Oh, here, it, this, is, this is not a very interesting example because once you go through this bridge, uh, you, you cannot send any other orc, but well, um, you, you get the idea. You, you basically get well, what the idea is. Um, so what you are given is these obstacles where like, like you see that there are no bridges, no, no nothing. And so the, the straightforward model for this is, um, well, I, I, I did not say the objective. Um, the, the question is basically to calc to compute, um, how many orcs will reach home. So, um, that will allow us to, to prepare the defensive forces. Yeah. In advance. Um, well, um, basically the, the, the the most uh, obvious model for this would be a max flow uh, algorithm from S to T. We put a node where the horde starts, a node destination where our home is, and we basically let the, the orcs flow from each cell to cell in this drawing. Um, so since we have a bridge that can be used only one, we will have bidirectional um, edges um, with capacity uh, one. There is a, a modeling trick here that um, actually the way the problem is stated, it would in principle be illegal to use the same bridge twice. Uh, one for the going edge uh, to the right, let's say, and one for the edge to the right, left. Um, those, this model using uh, undirected edges or double edges um, would actually be wrong. Um, but it doesn't matter because any solution where you have an arc going that way, uh, say this one. And uh, let's say this orc does this and another solution another orc going that way so that both are, the, are used uh, when well, this solution can always be transformed to another one where one of, of the orcs goes like this and the other one goes like this and this bridge is actually never used and everything uh, stays the same so that is a a very common trick with with problems where to eliminate crossings in, in this case, just to reason that th there won't be crossing or, or, if, or, or if they were, we could eliminate them. It's not a problem. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically it. We can create that graph. One a node per each cell in this grid. Um, bidirectional edges everywhere. We only, we just omit the, those cells with obstacles. Those are not allowed to be used. And uh, well, of course we have edges um, well, th this one could be directed or, or not, that does not matter, because we know that we are going from north to south. Uh, this is the, the la these are the, the ending points, so we know the direction. Um, so yeah, this is basically the graph. And here we would want to compute a max flow. So um, the idea is to do it with less complexity, to do it uh, cheaper so that it does not uh, um, give time limit exceeded for the particular bounds of this problem. Um, and so the way to do that is um, to to translate it to a mean, uh, well, it, it is a mean cut problem because max flow equals mean cut, um, but we want to translate it to a minimum path problem using a graph duality. Um, basically we can because this is a planar graph. Uh, I mean, there is a, there is a, a subtle detail in that um, in this drawing, the graph over which we are uh, we want to compute the minimum cut is the graph of the regions, because everywhere I said you come th that that um, if you were to use uh, um, your notebooks, let's say um, Maxflow algorithm, you would put one node per cell here 
and one node for home and one node for hold. So that, those are um, the regions in this drawing. If you take the drawing as is, the, the nodes would be um, these corners in the grid. But uh, remember that the dual of the dual is the original graph. So the duality goes both ways. Um, you can always, if, if your original problem is about uh, regions, then um, you can swap to the dual graph, which will be the one with the points and not the regions. And the duality will still works. So just like before, if in we, we are, if we want to compute the minimum cut of the regions, let's say, well, by the same reasoning as before, uh, that will be um, a minimum path in the graph, in the dual graph of the regions. But the dual graph of the regions is again just the graph, the drawing itself with the points. Um, so that is what we will have to compute. Um, well, let, let's see if uh, we can do that. Let's go back a bit to our method. Uh, when we had a mean cut, when we wanted to compute a mean cut from S to T uh, in G, in the graph G, we had to look um, for a region in the dual graph um, containing both S and T in the boundary. That was the easy case. So we really preferred uh, to do that one um, because then the only thing we have to do is to split the um, that uh, region into two and to compute a mean path from one of them to the other one. Okay, let's see if we can do this. Here we remember uh, taking this um, drawing, taking this drawing to be uh, G, um, I mean, the drawing is the grid itself. So this would be the nodes. Um, then we are actually interested in a cut um, in the graph of regions. So we are already taking uh, the dual as our basic graph. So when we look for a region in the dual, what we see, since the region here are our basic nodes, this is a node, this is a node, this is a node, but in the, in the drawing, these are regions. What we are looking for is not like here, a region containing both S and T. Remember that uh, here S and T are basically the hold region and the home region. Um, we are looking for, instead of a region, we're looking for a vertex touching both regions, the start region and the end region. That will make our life easier. So uh, do we have that? No, unfortunately, no. We have uh, this vertex in the drawing uh, touching the, the home uh, region and these vertices, but they don't uh, seem to work. So we will have to, to fix that. Well, the problem is basically that um, these are all separated by the outer region, but the outer region is not uh, helping too much here. So we will just uh, break this up so that it better lines up with our model. Uh, once you gain some intuition about um, these processes, um, you probably can um, skip this, um, these steps that I am doing to trying to, to mechanically apply the, um, the ideas that, that we've uh, already developed just like they were, uh, making a one, by, uh, one uh, for one correspondence. Um, you, you may, maybe you can intuit, oh yeah, I, I must cut north from south. So I am looking for a path from east to west. That's it. And that intuition is basically correct, but let's check that, uh, the notions that we have developed, uh, formally, uh, work here. Exactly. Yeah, even if we mechanically follow them. So, uh, we will split and say, okay, the horde is now the outer region, but, uh, then that will allow orcs to enter this way from the sides. We don't want that. So um, we will uh, solve that by manipulating um, the costs of the edges. I didn't talk about the cost of the edges, but um, that was because basically we weren't using the outer region. We, we implicitly were never talking about the outer region. It's like, like as if it was not a valid uh, node. Now we would like to have it as a valid node because that would uh, make the, the reasoning in terms of the graph easier, but then uh, if, if we have it as a node, then these edges a priori exist and those uh, we would not want them to exist. So which I can just give them 
all a capacity of zero. That's it, simple. We can imagine that all of these edges exist, but have a capacity of zero. That solves the problem. You can't use them in the flow. That's it. And the ones in the north have a capacity of one, of course, just like all the others in the middle. Uh, all of these have capacity one and are uh, bidirectional, of course. So it is, it is the case that we're interested in. It is the undirected case and we have capacities in, in the edges. So, so far, so good. Um, well, what about a uh, home? Uh, just the same. These, these edges would all have um, a capacity of zero because since the horde is now the outer region, uh, having capacity here would allow an, an orc to directly enter home this way, and that's not allowed. They should go uh, all through the, um, through, through the map, let's say, from the north. So the border has all zeros. That's it. But um, now with this new notion, um, the model works again. It's very similar, but we are taking into account the outer region. And that gives us a vertex um, where our start and destination regions touch. Uh, for example, we could take this vertex. This vertex, OK, let, let's paint it uh, this color. This vertex, we might call it R. Um, even though it's not a region here, because it plays the exact same role as the region R played before. So we want a cut from S to T, so we need uh, a region in the dual uh, that touches both of them. So that is exactly what we have here. Here, S and T would be this region and the outer region uh, in the dual graph. So in the dual's dual, a region uh, touching both is just the region corresponding to this vertex. I, I could draw the duals dual, but again, it is just the drawing. So that's it. So what do we have to do now? Well, we have to split all the edges. Remember, we have to split that, um, that special uh, region. And to split it, we take all the edges that on its boundary all the edges are touching those that um, region and cut at S and T. So we can basically do the same. This, um, but this case is trivial because um, the, the cutting, so to speak, is trivial because for this point there are only two um, edges. If there had been uh, more edges, then there would be two interesting regions, our home region and our destination region, start and end. Um, and so we would cut, we could cut these uh, edges into two sets, uh, splitting them at the interesting um, S and T uh, regions. But here we have only two. So since we have only two, um, the drawing is la like this. You have the node, two edges, and those you have one region on one side, one region on the other. Um, that, that's it, no, no splitting. I mean, the split is one and the other. So when you go from S to T, you get this. When you go from T to S, you get this. That's trivial. All this to say that uh, then um, the splitting that we would do here between the green uh, edges and the blue edges, so to speak, is simply one edge is green, one edge is blue. No thinking. So this node R is split into two nodes, basically. One of the nodes gets this edge, and the other node gets this edge. And we need a path from one to the other. But it, it's like cutting the dot like this. But yeah, all of that is to say that uh, then we are looking for a path from here, because since this edge will have to be used, we have to go from here to here. So that's it. The new problem is that we are looking for a minimum path. Uh, by the same reasoning that we have made before, we are looking for a minimum path in this graph. When I say this graph, now it is not the one of the regions where we move like the orcs in between. No, it's the one of the drawing. So each corner is um, a node. All of the borders have uh, are edges 
having cost zero, except for the top ones, we have cost one. If you move from this corner to this corner, then it costs one. Um, and the same, uh, if you move from here to here, it costs one. Um, and we have to go from this start to this end. And we want the shortest possible path. Uh, that's it. That, that's the result of mechanically applying the transformation that we've learned. Um, this is very intuitive because if, you, if we forget about the, the mechanical transformation that we've done, since all of these um, left edges have a cost of zero and all of these have a cost of zero, it's as if we could, we, it's just like we could merge them into a single node because in terms of um, minimum path, once you get reach any of them, you can get all the others with the same cost because the, the edges have zero cost. Um, so basically it is the same as saying we want a path uh, along the, the lines in the grid um, of minimum cost going from left to the right. So that's it. This path would cut. Um, and that's it basically. That's that's basically it. Yeah. Um, well, the, the detail is that um, moving, I, I might not have made this clear, but moving from here to here will have a cost of zero because um, the, the, the corresponding edge, the, this node um, was forbidden for the, for the orcs. Um, and so the, a, a simple way to model it so that we still have a grid and can apply the, the dual graph and all the reasoning, it's just to think that, okay, all the edges around it um, have z zero capacity. So no orc will ever enter. It's the same as removing the node. But that means that uh, now, uh, when we are in the dual graph, we can um, go through those edges with a cost of zero, which, it, which is good because we want to cross from left to right with minimum possible cost. Um, just to check this example, um, here basically the solution would be to go uh, here, all of this path has cost zero. Here I have to pay cost one, but that's it. All the others have cost zero and I reach the end. Uh, and this is the minimum path. I, I, there is no way to reach um, from here to here with, um, with zero uh, cost. So the minimum is one. And like we already had seen before, um, this is the min cut and the max flow. So um, this solves the problem. And, and since this can be solved basically by BFS, it, it has a better complexity uh, than using um, other flow algorithms. Now, there is an interesting detail or trick that I would like to, to mention here. Um, take, for example, um, this case that I have drawn. Um, in, the, in, in the problem that we just uh, saw, the solution to this instance would be two, because you can basically send two orcs, one uh, north to south, and this breaks these two bridges. Um, but then you could send another one this way from west to east, uh, which breaks the other two bridges. And now there's no way to cross this um, this uh, gap. So uh, two is the maximum possible. In terms of the mean path that we've seen, well, you can basically get from left to right with cost uh, two, because you have to jump this uh, this gap, uh, because all of this has is free, has cost zero, but you have to jump here and this cost one, two, basically. But um, there is a related problem, a variation, where um, which corresponds to um, asking for the mean cut, not in terms of edges, but in terms of nodes. So uh, it would be like saying, okay, how, instead of how many bridges do I have to destroy, that would be the previous version stated that in terms of a cut. How many bridges do I have to destroy so that no orc can uh, arrive at home? Um, Instead of that, we could say, well, okay, how many cells, which are the, the nodes in the max flow graph, um, how many cells do I have to destroy to avoid uh, any orcs passing? Or equivalently, it's just like saying how many orcs can arrive uh, if no orc can share ever a cell. 
uh, then the answer here would be one because this cell is critical. Um, well, how do we solve that? The, um, the typical, the, the, the classical trick for this in terms of graphs, in general graphs, uh, is to duplicate uh, each node. So we can split each node into uh, an input version and an output version of the node V. Um, and thus we can add a, a special edge from the input node to the output node. And here we can put the capacity, the maximum capacity of the vertex by forcing uh, anything anything that goes through the vertex to uh, enter the input node, cross the edge and then go out the output node, uh, we can control the capacity of the vertex itself uh, with the capacity of this new edge. And the graph uh, just gets uh, twice as many nodes, so it's not too big in terms of constant. Um, okay. Uh, but this has a problem. Um, well, uh, of course, if, if, the, if for every edge V, W that you had in the original one, well, you go from V out to W in, that's the trick. And for every uh, edge that entered uh, V, you will go from the output of the previous one to the input. So that uh, going through V requires uh, arriving at the input one, crossing and then leaving. So. The problem is that this could destroy, using this trick, uh, could destroy our whole plan of using um, the planarity. Because um, we have a planar graph. If we start to modify it in some complicated way, we will stop having a planar graph. And let's say, since this is the grid, if we duplicate every node in the grid, it's like we have something like this. This this would be the, the split version of the of the neighbors of this node. And now we are in a complication because we have to connect all of them. So we have to connect the output of this one to the input of the right one and to the input of the left one. And the same for this one, like this. Mm. So it, it, it gets complicated very fast. And basically you, you have to cross yourself. Um, th th this won't uh, work. So should we give up? No, we should not give up. There is a trick. Um, basically, instead of doing this uh, general trick uh, that we do for for a general graph, we can uh, remain uh, remember that we're having we, that we have a planar graph. So we can go back to the idea, to the original idea, in terms of the planar graph, and see what happens. So now we are looking for a cut. Before the plan was we want a cut between S and T. So a cut in the case of a planar drawing can actually be drawn as, as a curve cutting S from T and then the cut will be the edges that uh, that are crossed by the cutting curve. Um, and so that ends up being a certain path in the dual graph. Now, if we allow to cut uh, nodes and we want to cut as, as few nodes as possible, well, it, it's basically the, the same idea. Um, the, the only difference is that now the line should be crossing through the nodes and not um, and not through the edges, not like this. Like, say this, this would be an, an example. So this could be um, a cutting line representing that we're going to cut this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex. And just like before, um, if a set of vertex successfully separates S from T, then there will be a curve in the plane um, going through those vertices um, and, and not through edges. Um, basically because crossing a vertex is more powerful than crossing an edge. If you want, um, say, say here, like I did, if I wanted to, um, if I wanted to cross um, this edge now, well, I could just cross um, like this through the vertex and the same for every edge. Whenever you want to cross an edge, you can move a little and cross uh, through the vertex. And, and so um, you, you can assume that you're only crossing through vertices. Um, vertices are more powerful. Um, you can have a, a mix. If you have a cost for cutting an edge and a cost for cutting a, a vertex, well, you can put in the, in the graph both options. From a certain region, you can move to an adjacent region directly, paying the cost of the edge, or you can cross um, to a sort of adjacent region through a vertex, uh, paying the cost of the vertex. That's, that works too. Um, so 
basically it's the same idea then um we want um a path a minimum path in the in the dual graph with a slight modification we don't take um the standard let's say dual graph but a modification of the dual graph where the regions are the same that that doesn't change but the the neighbors of a region change um instead of having only those neighbors um uh, corresponding to the edges we uh we now can cross to to any uh other region sharing at least a vertex with the current um region and the cost of crossings such is the cost of cutting the vertex with that slight modification um we can still solve the problem of a uh, min cut even though it's a vertex min cut without changing the shape of the network and that is critical because then we can use the original planar network so when we apply it to our case um since the network shape has not changed at all the only thing that changed is the rule of when can we uh jump between two um between two uh points in the dual here the dual has uh, the points because our original problem was in terms of region the, the dual always uh, changes remember that it goes both ways so here where the drawing of the flow problem has dots um, in terms of regions the mean uh, path can cross through through vertices so when we apply duality and change all those concepts that means that here uh, in the mean path that goes through uh, nodes we are allowed to go to a neighboring node if um, in order to um, go to that node we just are crossing a region so I did not draw the whole grid but remember that this is a grid the full graph in theory as we modeled it had a full grid so each region is one of these cells so what this means is that from a certain node its neighbors are now um, those that you can reach f uh, by going through a region so the the neighbors are all the like the king movement in chess the the eight neighbors um including the diagonals and that's basically it like like before um cross th these regions where no orc could uh, move all of these movements including the diagonal if we want will have uh, a cost of zero but critically critically in the in the interesting part where we have to pay a cost um now diagonal movements here uh will have a cost of one so now we can cross from left to right with um a cost total cost of one because this is the only movement that we had to pay um and that is why the, the answer ends up being one for this case so that's the only change that you have to do to um model the the case of uh, vertex min cut so that that's good to know now let's continue studying um other graph concepts that dualize let's continue um we just saw um another pair of uh dual concepts we know that max flow which equals min cut um dualizes uh into mean path and, and vice versa if you have a minimum um if you want to calculate calculate a mean path those are related um to mean cut in the dual graph um by by the process that we have already seen um so let's uh let's study another concept another pair of concept and so let's study the case of a um of a bipartite graph suppose we have a connected bipartite graph g g is a connected bipartite graph so um i i will just focus on the connected case so that um everything is um clearer and simpler um we can always analyze uh, each connected component and also in the connected case we have that the dual of the dual is the original so duality works actually works as a duality and when the graph is not connected we we know that uh, that is not true but almost uh, all, all that happens is that the disconnected components get um, merged when, once you apply the double dual um, so okay uh, we have a connected bipartite graph uh, G uh, what does uh, having a bipartite graph means well um, it means that its vertices can be split into two sets uh, 
the vertices of set V1 and V2 and all edges cross in between. There are no edges uh, that are sort of like this inside. No, 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 that, that this is forbidden. This is completely forbidden. So, um, so if we have a bipartite graph, um, what happens to the dual graph? Well, let's, let's imagine we have a region in the dual graph because a region will be a node in the dual graph. Let's, let's graph this. This triangle is meant to be um, one node of the dual. So the dual will, will go like this, um, etc. But this is the um, region in the original graph. So I am drawing G in white and its dual graph in uh, green, which would look like this. Well, so what can we say about the ver vertices of the dual graph? If we know that G is um, Bipartit. Well, um, here, here, if if the if the lecture was um, actually an interactive lecture, here I would pause and, and ask you to to think about it and, and tell me. Um, the, so maybe the um, th those of you who know some properties about bipartite graphs and other kind of graphs already know. Oh, that means that bipartite G implies uh -huh, something uh, G G dual. Okay, well, a very known, well-known problem uh, property actually of uh, bipartite graphs is that um, they have no odd cycles. All cycles are, are of uh, even length, no odd cycles. That means no um, cycles having an odd number of edges. Uh, it's actually a equivalent. Um, basically a graph with no odd cycles is bipartite. Um, okay. And what does it mean? Well, if you look at the drawing, you will see that um, for any region in the dual graph, its boundary is a cycle. Its boundary is a cycle. And so it must have an even length because in G, all cycles, not only those specific cycles that are uh, boundaries of regions. No, all cycles, but in particular those that are boundaries of regions, all have um, even length. Uh, so the number of edges in the boundary of the region uh, must be even, in this case, six. But uh, that number is also the degree of um, that region <laughs> looked as a vertex of the dual graph. So the degree will be uh, even. And you might know that when a graph has um, all nodes of uh, even degree, then if the graph is also connected, then the graph is um, Eulerian. It's an Eulerian graph. It has an Euler cycle. An Euler cycle means that it has a single cycle that without repeating edges, it might repeat nodes, but without repeating edges, it um, goes through each edge exactly once and come back uh, to the same point. So this is very interesting uh, to note. We we basically have proved that if you have a bipartite graph G, then automatically um, its dual is Eulerian. Because actually the, the dual graph will have all the uh, degrees uh, even we have proved that and uh, it will always be connected so this um, th this this uh, arrow to the right always holds now I should make a note here because I have said that um, the boundary of a region will always be a cycle I've used that uh, to prove this but is it true that the uh, boundary of a region is always a cycle um, well in a sense it is but we have to be careful um, by what I mean. For example, um, if you had, a, say, this planar graph, which is a, a path or a tree, um, it's okay, this, it could be a more interesting tree. This has a single region, uh, the outer region R. Uh, there are no other regions because there are no uh, simple cycles here. Uh, so how can I say that the boundary is a cycle? I mean, the boundary will have all of these edges. Um, well, uh, there is a trick which 
we will use uh, again later when we actually compute dual graphs. Um, that is that um, for each edge, we will imagine that it is actually composed of two uh, sides, sort sort of speak. So each edge for to us will be uh, like a wall which has two sides. Like for example, I don't know this this. Uh, edge is a wall that has an, a north side and a south side. Like if you were walking, you could actually, uh, you, you could not walk on the wall. You always would have to choose, well, are you walking on the north side or on the south side? Something like that. That way, uh, if you have M edges on the graph, you actually have two M uh, sides in total to, um, to distribute among uh, regions. So, and that is key because actually when you have a region, that region um, more specifically than touching edges, that region touches sides of edges. And in this example where we have a, an hexagonal region, um, only the inner sides um, of these six edges are being, um, oh, they are seven. So only the only the the inner regions of the seven edges are being uh, touched so um this one would have degree uh, 7 um but in this case of the region on the right um the outer region touches six um edge sides so it would have degree um the degree of this region would actually be 6 even though only three um, edges are involved. It doesn't matter. What matters is the number of sides. Um, and we can check that because if we actually draw the, the, the dual graph, um, since the region touches um, both sides, all of these edges will become loops in the dual graph. And it is a very common convention because it makes um, almost all the equations uh, keep working in the presence of loops, and this is no exception, that when you have a loop, um, you count uh, the degree uh, twice. So each loop adds two to the degree of the node, basically because you count how many um, endings of, a, of an edge uh, touch a certain node. So when you have a node, when you have a loop, sorry, um, you have two, um, edge endings touching the node. So that's why it's plus two. So uh, a node like this will have degree six. Um, and so it's that, so that that's why um, this is actually odd. Uh, sorry, this is actually even uh, and not odd. And actually it is also a cycle because we can imagine, which is, was my initial um, claim. My initial claim was not only that it was even it was that it was a cycle and the fact that it was a cycle allowed me to prove that it was even but it is um a cycle because we can start walking like this on the upper side of this wall then uh, turn here okay we've we, we, we've done this and here we complete the cycle and by doing that you can count and we did one two three four five six steps um so when you understand it that way like walking the whole uh, boundary of the region, which uh, in this case, it's like I am walking and, and sticking my, my left hand uh, right to the, uh, right at the, at the wall. So, um, and, and I keep walking like that. And when I go get back exactly to the place I was before, um, I, I have done six steps. So that's why this is a cycle of length uh, six, six. And, Basically, when you think about it like that, like, okay, start walking with your left uh, hand, uh, always uh, sticking, um, always touching the wall until you come back. Uh, it's quite obvious that, um, first of all, that, that you will eventually come back uh, because um, otherwise you would run out of of, uh, of graph. So you will have to come back eventually. Um, and also that it will always be a cycle. So uh, once you have established that it is a cycle, then the fact that the original graph G was bipartite implies that it is an even cycle. Um, and that's why uh, the degrees in the dual graph become all even because uh, the length of that, those um, cycles that form the boundary 
of um, each region uh, are now even and they are the degree of the uh, node in the dual graph. Um, this idea of um, walking uh, across the boundary is critical to creating the dual graph. We will come back to this later. So, and finally, I want to mention that uh, this property also goes uh, the other way. If you have an Eulerian graph uh, G, then you can always say that um, the dual graph will be bipartite. And the proof of this is similar, and it's also similar to the theorems of uh, Stoke or Green in analysis, where you, um, in calculus, I mean, where um, where you decompose um, a larger cycle in terms of a smaller cycles. Uh, well, the idea is the same. If your graph is uh, Eulerian, um, then you know that all uh, nodes have even length, uh, sorry, even degree, because that's the the criteria for being um, an Eulerian graph. You have to have a uh, even degree in all vertices, and uh, you have to be connected. So if uh, if your graph uh, has all nodes of even degree, when you go to the dual graph, what you have is that the regions, each um, region in the dual graph, of course, will correspond to one of your original vertices. If G is painted like this, when we look at the dual graph, each region um, corresponds to one of your original vertices. And uh, since those had odd, uh, even degrees, sorry, um, that means that uh, each uh, region in the dual graph has an even boundary. So when you analyze uh, a, ge a general cycle, any cycle in the graph, it might not be exactly um, one region. That's why we, we still haven't finished. If I want to prove that the dual is bipartite, partite well, uh, I should show that any cycle is uh, even, not only those of regions. But any general cycle will span uh, many regions, basically. That, that's what it will do. As any simple cycle, it suffices to consider simple cycles. Uh, any simple cycles will be like this, and it will uh, span several regions. Now, uh, if you take the symmetric difference of uh, the edges in uh, these regions, uh, you will find that the resulting edges will be exactly uh, those of the uh, cycle because the inner ones uh, will appear twice and those will uh, disappear from the symmetric difference. The symmetric difference is like the XOR. Um, so um, th those which appear um, an even number of times don't remain and those that appear an odd number of times remain. And a critical property of symmetric difference is that um, if you have uh, sets of even size, then uh, the symmetric difference will still have even size. Uh, and thus, since each region has even size, the, the total uh, cycle will have even size too. So why might it be uh, useful? Well, um, maybe uh, you want to avoid uh, computing the, the, um, the dual graph because actually both of these conditions are very easy to check. It is very easy to check if a graph is bipartite and it's very easy to check if a graph is uh, Eulerian. Um, so maybe if the problem uh, describes uh, a story in terms of region and something, and for example, I don't know, you, you have to decide if there is a, a path uh, through the regions of your drawing that um, go through every wall um, exactly once and comes back to the same region. Well, that's the same as asking if uh, the dual graph is Eulerian. And instead of computing the dual graph, and checking for Eulerian, maybe you want to simply check if the original one is bipartite. And thanks to, to our calculations, that will basically be the same. Now, using these ideas, we can attack a pretty, pretty hard problem, which is the max cut problem. The classic max cut problem is um, a classic MP hard problem. What does it ask? Giving uh, a graph G, what we must do is partition the vertices of G into two sets, V1 and V2, however we like. It's uh, sort of like uh, a bipartite, but we're not given the bipartition. We must create the bipartition. And then what, what we try to do um, is to create um, the largest possible bipartite from the original graph G. Uh, it's something like that. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, if this is the way you cut the graph, you divided it in these nodes, RB1, these nodes, RB2, 
then uh, you consider all the edges that cross this is why I mean like a bipartite. The, those that get inside you, you ignore them. You concentrate only on those that are crossing your proposed uh, partition in, into B1 and B2. And then you count how many of those there are. Um, and that is the, um, the, the value of your cut, the capacity of your cut, how many uh, edges are crossing. And well, you want to calculate the maximum possible cut among all possible partitions um, into B1 and B2. That's it. That's the goal of the max cut uh, problem. And this is NP hard for a general pro, uh, graph, uh, meaning, um, well, meaning a lot of things, but um, we don't expect uh, there to exist a polynomial um, algorithm for this. But um, there is for the case of planar graphs. So let's remember that we're studying planar graphs and let's see how we can actually um, solve the max cut problem in polynomial time uh, for planar graphs. And we will use the, the ideas that we have been um, developing uh, just, uh, just a moment ago. We will use this idea of uh, bipartite and Eulerian and how they are related. Um, well, another, um, ba based on how I presented the max cut problem, uh, we see that we can um, we can actually uh, think of it um, a little bit uh, differently. We can think of it like, okay, um, say we have the whole graph G, whatever it is, we are given a graph and uh, it is not uh, bipartite yet because, well, uh, if it were bipartite, it's a trivial case. Uh, you take the, the bipartition and you make, and you're making um, all the edges of the graph um, be part of the cut. So that's awesome. That's the maximum possible. But of course, uh, an interesting instance is not already be part it. So um, basically, uh, the max cut problem is equ equivalent to saying, okay, you can remove edges from the graph that you will decide, okay, this will not be part of the cut until you get a be part it graph because uh, for, when you consider only these green edges that will be part of the cut, well, that forms a bipartite graph, clearly. So uh, an equivalent way to state it is to say, okay, remove as few edges as possible so that the remaining graph is bipartite. But this is interesting because if we start with a planar graph, well, we'll when we remove um, edges, it will still be a planar graph and we will eventually arrive at a bipartite graph. That means that means that the dual graph of that uh, resulting graph after we remove edges will be Eulerian and vice versa. Um, um, if we get to a if we get to a Eulerian um, dual graph, then uh, we will be okay. Oops, and that is basically um, the idea. So. Uh, we take the original graph, we can compute its dual graph like this, say, okay, and um, okay, here, an outer edge. This will be the dual graph, more or less, I think, like, oh, I, I took a very, a very large graph for, for the example. There. Oh, no more edges. Oops. Lots of edges. Okay. Okay. This is our dual graph initially. And this is our graph initially. So um, our plan is to remove some edges from G, but that will also change the dual graph. And our mission, our mission is that the result um, is a bipartite graph in G. But since that is hard in general, we will uh, try to check if maybe it's easier to concentrate on the um, dual graph and remove things until it gets Eulerian. And that's much easier. That's a much easier problem to solve. Um, so, okay, let's concentrate on that. The problem is that, okay, we can compute the original dual, but we are going to be removing edges. So we must understand, in order to reason about this problem, we should understand what happens to the dual graph when you remove an edge of a graph. 
uh, but that is not hard, so let's think about it. Um, basically, there are two cases. If you are going to remove an edge E from a graph, uh, G, well, that is obviously an edge in the dual graph too. The, the dual graph uh, maps edges to edges. And there are two cases. Um, either E is a bridge or not. If the edge is a bridge, then in the original graph, well, there are many things. I'm, I'm not sure what, what the rest of the graph is, but I can be completely sure that because it is a bridge, we've already analyzed it before, the same region R will touch both, both um, sides. So in the dual graph, it will be a loop, a loop that is part of the region R. Yes, that is because uh, this was a bridge, so that means that this is the drawing is like this. It has um, um, different connected, um, like removing it creates two different connected components. So this is the situation uh, when you include it, and um, and so um, the region R um, spans all the the outside. There might be other things in in the graph if G was not connected. That there might be another cycle. Uh, outside covering all of this, but it doesn't matter. The, the region R uh, will attach this edge in both sides. So we know that when E is a bridge, it's a loop in the dual graph. And what happens when we remove it? Well, uh, it's clear that um, the only, the, the, it has no effect at all in the dual graph except erasing the edge, the loop itself. There's no other effect. Other regions are no affected. Um, in fact, the region R itself is not really affected. Um, all the neighborings, all the, um, the relationships of neighbors between regions are exactly the same. There are no, if these were countries, say, no, there have been no merges, no splits, no changes of territories, nothing. Um, there was a boundary, an internal boundary of, of the country of R with itself, and we delete that. So, okay, now, now we can freely cross here, but it doesn't change uh, at all. So the only effect is to remove the loop. So that is uh, quite simple. If you have a bridge, which is exactly a loop in the dual, you can remove it and that's it. So simple case. Loops in the dual can be removed that because that is like removing an, a bridge in the original and that's valid and you get the new dual, no problem. But what happens if you remove an edge E that is not a bridge? Well, that, that, is, that is the interesting change. If E not a bridge. Well, in that case, we, we can analyze similarly, but what matters is that there are two regions now. Um, one on one side and the other on the other. This is basically because of the reasoning that we did previously. Um, Otherwise, it would, um, if, if it were the same re region, it would be a loop in the dual, and we, we already made all the, the case analysis that a loop is exactly a, a bridge in the original. Um, so yeah, the other case is that it is not a loop, it is uh, an edge connecting in the dual um, the nodes of region one and region two. So what happens when we destroy this edge well, of course, um, we might think that the edge is destroyed, but that's not enough because now uh, we do have um, a merge, so to speak. Uh, once we destroy this edge, um, like this, region 1 and region 2 become uh, one single region. Um, and that's it. There, there are no other changes. Well, of course, the... Of course, the edge itself is gone. We have deleted it, so we should uh, also delete it when we merge, but um, that's it. Both regions uh, merge into a single new region. Um, no other uh, neighbors are affected. Well, well, yes, of course, um, both nodes are destroyed in the merge and a new node R is created. So all, uh, all edges involving R1 and R2 uh, have to change somehow, but the change is uh, very simple. You you can see um, because of the drawing that uh, no matter who it is, uh, for each edge that you had between R1 and another uh, region, say R3, um, 
well, it doesn't matter if the edge um, came from R1 or R2. Uh, it, 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 it is um, an edge that will be there between R and R3 after the merge. So basically, the merge operation um, destroys the edge. It is not there anymore. Replaces um, both nodes with a new node. And that node um, has uh, exactly one edge for each of the edges of either R1 um, or R2. So we can say that uh, for the new node R, its degree will be the sum of the degrees of the originals. Minus one, because uh, we've destroyed, uh, sorry, mi minus two actually. Because um, we lost one degree of R2 and one degree of R1 because we destroyed the edge. That is the change. Um, well, and if and if there was um, another edge between uh, R1 and R2 because they those two regions touched somewhere else, well, of course that uh, well the drawing was right. That that actually uh, stays as a loop because um, that will now be a, a border uh, between uh, this region and itself because it has merged. Um, yeah, that's okay, but that doesn't change. Uh, this property at all. So that's basically the other situation. So in terms of the dual graph, uh, when we are removing edges from a planar graph, and we but we don't uh, look at the original, we we just look at at the at the dual. Uh, the operation of removing edges can be thought like this. Okay, you are allowed to remove loops, and that one is easy. If you remove a loop, nothing happens. Or the interesting case is that you remove a non-loop edge. And then uh, you not only remove the edge, but you have to merge uh, both its um, its endpoints. Um, you you could think that the operation is always to remove the edge and merge its endpoints. And the case of a loop simply implies merging a node with itself, so no change. Um, and that's it. Okay, that that's interesting. So with this in mind, with this in mind. Um, then the new problem is basically we're given a graph, which we will take as the dual graph of the original planar graph, um, and we want to apply this operation repeatedly as few times as possible because uh, each time we apply it, we destroy one of the edges of the ori of the graph, and we want to remove as few as possible to get a bipartite graph. But if we're thinking about the dual graph always, we want to arrive to a dual graph that is Eulerian. So uh, we want to apply these operations as few times as possible to get to a Eulerian graph. Um, well, that's an interesting problem because remember that the condition for a graph to be Eulerian is that all its um, degrees must be even, all even degree. So. We can look for the vertices with odd degree, those that are not working, because if originally they are all even degree, we're done. Remember that it is the dual graph, so it will always be connected. There is no problem about connectivity. Um, if all graphs have even degree, we're done. If not, there will be an even amount, uh, an even number of um, odd vertices. And uh, we would like to make operations so that um, they, they disappear. We want to get only to um, even degrees. Now, if you have a node with even degree, I, I'll write um, zero for even degree and one for odd degree. If you have a node with odd degree and a node with uh, even degree, um, well, thanks to this rule, thanks to this rule, when you merge two nodes, um, you will get the parity of the sum, basically. So uh, merging, um, so when you merge uh, even with odd, the new node will have odd parity. So no good, does not help us. Um, when you merge, um, what can I merge? Mm. When you merge um, two um, uh, even nodes, the result will have uh, even parity. So, okay, good, but this also does not really help us because we want to destroy um, 
those of even parity. So the, the, the only useful thing to do uh, for us is to actually uh, merge an edge connecting to nodes of odd parity, because then uh, that will become uh, a new node of even parity and great, we destroyed two uh, nodes of uh, odd parity. So uh, this would suggest that uh, in order to, to do that, we might find paths connecting pairs of, uh, maybe this one is direct, um, of odd um, vertices, and then we uh, apply the operations uh, merging uh, this through these edges repeatedly. And this will uh, bring um, the odd uh, vertex closer and closer to its companion, and finally, uh, boom, it will uh, merge into a single node of um, degree zero. So uh, it looks like um, we have to pair somehow create a matching uh, between these odd uh, degree vertices um, of the minimum possible cost. And the cost, which is the number of edges we had to merge, is the shortest path between those nodes. So basically, we can uh, run Floyd Warshall or similar to um, compute distances in the dual uh, graph and get all the, the, the distances. Um, or at least the distances between the, the odd uh, vertices. Those are the ones that are matter to us, but maybe we are unlucky and all vertices uh, have um, odd degree. Um, what else? And then uh, finally, yeah, finally after doing that, um, we want to find a minimum cost matching. We want to match uh, all of them uh, in the cheapest possible way. And that is basically the solution. That can be done uh, with, uh, with the Edmonds, with the Edmonds uh, Blossom algorithm, which is quite uh, tricky to implement, but there is a nice uh, posting code forces with a not so bad implementation. It is still quite tricky, but okay. It's not that bad. Uh, the, I, before seeing that post, I thought it was super impossible. Well, it's not that terrible. But yeah, this is an algorithm that you would like to copy and paste uh, and have, have pre-coded. You, you don't really want to code it in the moment. But if you do, if you have it, uh, then congratulations. You can, you can basically uh, solve uh, this MP hard problem, MaxCAD, in a planar graph. You create the dual graph. Um, you identify which vertices have a odd degree. You compute the, the the distance matrix, and that are your and those are your cost to uh, for the matching algorithm. And the minimum matching, uh, the minimum cost matching will um, give you the minimum number of edges that you have to remove to make everything work. So the total number of edges minus that will be the maximum uh, cut. There is a slight detail here uh, that I went over, uh, which is uh, what happens if actually um, two paths um, try to use the same uh, cross and try to use the same um, edge. Um, well, uh, the thing is, it won't matter. Basically, um, if that you don't have to worry about it, because if two paths, um, uh, well, yeah, if, if two paths cannot share an edge, so each edge will be used uh, at most once for the merging process. Because if you have two paths, say this one and this one, that try to use the same edge, well, there is a better matching uh, which avoids this edge completely, which is much the other way, like this. Uh, there, and let's say there. And this is cheaper by one uh, by by two, <laughs> because uh, you had to use this edge uh, twice, and now you don't use it. So this is cheaper. So if you take the minimum cost, um, there will never be an edge used twice. And if you have a sort of a cross like this, um, well, it, it, it doesn't matter because it will create. Uh, okay, uh, you you will your merging will create one super node uh, after merging all. Um, but it's the same. Also, instead of having um, 
two nodes uh, of degree of even degree, you will end up with with one node of even degree. It's the same. It's no problem. So um, so yeah, the, the the crossings are are no problem. So this works. And this this is not an easy problem at all. But um, but after carefully um, after carefully uh, thinking about okay, let's. Let's see what happens if we go for the dual graph and 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 think a bit. Uh, we can re uh, reduce it to standard uh, polynomial algorithms. So th this is a very nice example. Well, we could check our algorithm with the example. Uh, let, let's see. <laughs> it is quite a hard example that I chose. Um, okay, we have to. We have the dual already drawn. We have to identify the degree uh, of vertices in the dual graph. Okay, one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight. Does it make sense? Um, yeah, it does. So this one is even, awesome, odd, odd. Oh, they are all degree three. So lots of odd uh, vertices. Also three. Oh, fi five odd vertices. That's impossible. Oh, I'm missing this one. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay. Mm hmm. So these are the vertices, and now I have to find a matching uh, where the cost of matching two two nodes is the the minimum path. Uh, okay, can I get? Oh, I, okay. The minimum cost possible would be three because I have to kill uh, three uh, three pairs of vertices. I can get. Uh, Two, but I'm not. I don't think with just three edges I can kill uh, all of them. Because yeah, this one's mm. yeah, it, it doesn't seem to be possible. I, I have to waste at least one somewhere else. Yeah, it, it would be great if these this were were neighbors, but not. Um, okay, so three seems to be impossible, and then four seems easy. I can pay. Uh, Two to fix these ones, and then uh, one, one. And that's all. So uh, four should be the minimum number of edges that I should remove. So if I look at the original uh, gra graph, the max cut should be uh, all except for four edges. Can I get that? Well, based on my solution, uh, I, I, I used, uh, I chose to merge this one. So that means that those are the edges that I should remove in the original one. So let's draw it again here, but with those removed. So, okay, after removing these four edges, we should have a bipartite graph. And yeah, it looks, it looks so. Yeah, I can paint it like this, and this is a, a valid bipartition. So yeah, this is the, the max cut. We've solved max cut for a planar graph. So now, to make it all complete, uh, we're missing the final piece of the puzzle, uh, which is how do we compute, how do we actually compute um, the dual graph of a planar drawing that we are given? Well, that, that's a good question. Um, because, yeah, th this is all very visual. Uh, like, I mean, I, I draw an example like this, and I say, well, okay, we, 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 we we as humans just glance at this drawing and say, oh, okay, there's a region here, there's a region here, but how do I represent that on the computer? Um, well, the, the dual graph as it is, yeah, well, the, our expected output is easy. I would like to, to have a representation, a adjacency list, anything reasonable uh, of a graph uh, uh, such that in this example, for example, uh, I get this, I get two nodes and four edges between them. Uh, this is the output I want to get, but well, how do I get it? Well, I would also have to ask uh, myself, how do I receive the input? Because, um, okay, to calculate the, to compute the, um, the dual graph, I do not only need the graph because we have already seen that there is no, uh, not one single uh, dual graph for a graph until you have it uh, drawn on the plane. Uh, the different ways of drawing it lead to different uh, non-isomorphic dual graphs. So I need a planar drawing. And how are we given the planar drawing? Well, a very common 
um, way that you are given a drawing when 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 you are given a drawing at all is uh, that you are given a straight line uh, drawing where you're promised okay the edges the graph is not only uh, drawn in a planar way but also all the edges are a straight line segment so i will just tell you where uh, in the plane each uh, vertex is apart from giving the graph the adjacency list for example uh, i will also tell you uh, for each node at which coordinates x y of the plane it is and that is enough for you because then you know that um that is enough to understand the whole drawing because uh, then you know that each edge is drawn not uh, in a complicated uh, curvy way but uh, as a straight line segment joining its two dots and you have the promise that it is actually a planar drawing and there are no crossings otherwise uh, this was all uh, this this would all break um okay great but what do we do with that well actually we don't need uh, so much uh, information all we need uh, to work is one thing uh, instead of having for each node its adjacency list in an arbitrary order we will need um, the adjacency list of each node sorted in a special order well it's not that special it's very simple what if you have a drawing on the plane and you have a certain node v well uh, in that drawing there there is a well-defined uh, circular order cyclic order of the edges um, of v um, there might be loops um, yeah there might be loops uh, if there are the loops will uh, touch v twice uh, and, and those they will still be there somewhere in the order um, a, a loop might even uh, cross something like this it, it doesn't really matter we, we we don't need to worry about it the normal algorithm will handle it just fine uh, but anyway in the straight line case there will be no loops so if you have a drawing uh, the drawing induces an order on the edges because if you uh, stand at v and um, loop through the walls like this um, uh, counterclockwise um, you will find them on a certain order if you have a straight line segment drawing which is quite common then um, all you need is to know <laughs> the x y uh, coordinates of uh, each vertex because having that when you're ordering the edges leaving uh, a certain node v um, you can calculate uh, these vectors and sort them uh, by angle basically and that is enough uh, so here we will have the anti-clockwise order a b c d which is of course a cyclic order so remember it is the same as b c d a and and so this these are these are always cyclic lists but it is not the same as DCBA. That would be the mirror image, basically, which matters for this. Um, but you have to be careful um, because this is the case for uh, line drawings. If for some reason this would be the order A, B, C, D for line segments. When you know that your drawing is line segment, well, you can just have the position uh, in the plane of each uh, node, and that's enough because the order will be the same. But if it is uh, somehow um, a curvy drawing, then maybe the order is different depending on the curves. For example, I could draw something like this, which is uh, quite ugly <laughs> and quite twisty. Uh, oh, and, and this leaves here. Okay. But it is a valid um, planar graph. And what matters is uh, if you stand at V and like uh, sweep, like turn standing at v in with in what order uh, you see the ed the living edges when you rotate counterclockwise so for example uh, it's arbitrary if i start here just because well first i will find the edge that goes to a so here the order is a first and then i find c and then i uh, find d as i rotate and finally i find b and then a again okay this is the order and uh, you can check that this is a different ordering this is not a rotation there is no way to to rotate them uh, so that they will become the same so um so this will lead to a different essentially different drawing that uh, the line version connections so if you have a uh, curvy lines um you actually need uh, 
to know the order somehow because uh, it's um, the x y positions alone do not determine uh, the drawing by itself um, but uh, even if you don't have the the x y positions if if for each node you know uh, the order that is enough that is actually the important information so maybe um, if the problem has to give you a drawing and does not use a straight lines um, the, the only reasonable way I can imagine, unless it describes these horrible curves somehow, is uh, to give you the ordering, and that is all you need. Anyway, the drawing defines a cyclic order of the edges uh, in the order that uh, they leave the vertex. Uh, Counterclockwise or clockwise, it doesn't matter, but we will fix uh, one order, for example, I'll say counterclockwise, and we will store all adjacency lists in that order. And that is enough to define the drawing. That is a very interesting property. That is all that matters for the drawing. If you have two different, uh, in the sense that they will generate uh, isomorphic identical um, dual graph. If you, if you have two different drawings, one with straight lines and one very complicated with curvy lines, but that both have the property that um, the order of the edges from each vertex uh, to its neighbors uh, cyclically uh, is, is identical, in both drawings, then they are the same drawing. They just distort it a bit, but uh, they are uh, they will give isomorphic uh, dual graphs. And the reason is that we will reason about our algorithm and check that it is correct. And well, it will only use this data. So this is all that matters. So what is the idea? Well, I I've already spoiled it sort, uh, sort, um, sort of before, because um, the key idea is that of uh, walking along the walls with uh, one hand, let's say, um, I don't know which, which hand should we, hmm. Yeah, that's right, the, le the left hand. We will walk um, along the border, um, like, like as if these were walls, with the left hand um, always uh, touching the wall, that's the plan. So I could walk inside this way. And if this was uh, were the external region, uh, the external region, I would uh, walk the other way. So this is a, p a peculiar thing. Um, for all regions, we will be uh, walking uh, clockwise. And this is intentional. If I order the list uh, counterclockwise, we will want to uh, walk in a clockwise order, which implies that my left hand is touching the, the wall. Um, but that is not true for the outer world. It's like the, the outer um, the outer region, the, the infinite region, is like it's inside out, so to speak. So if you look, uh, we actually uh, will, um, by, by working with the left hand uh, touching it, we walk it in the other way, uh, different to all the other ones that are sort of finite or internal regions. But this is the plan. Um, why is this nice? Well, because if you think about it for a moment, um, you will check that, uh, oh, I, I never said this, but we will do this for a connected graph. This is very, very important. It is not too hard to convince oneself that when one, um, for each possible um, cycle, because as we said before, all of this, uh, any possible um, walk with the left hand uh, on the wall like this, um, for each of these possible walks, um, there is a bijection between each possible walk and a region. Uh, that is very interesting. So for example, in this example where we, I have a, a simple cycle, there are two possible walks and only two. Uh, if I start on the outside, I will walk the, the whole outside and enter this loop. And um, if I walk uh, on the inside, I will walk like this and enter this loop. And those are the only two possible um, ways to walk here, the only two cycles. Um, and, and they correspond to the internal region and the external region. Well, that is true um, for any other graph like this. Um, for example, if, if I have something more more complicated, a planar graph, I don't know, like this, and uh, maybe uh, something like this, resembling a tree, or yeah, uh, why not? Okay, I have uh, one possible way to walk like this, one possible way to walk like this, and then when wherever I start on the outside, I, I will walk with the left hand, uh, stick to the wall and make all of this, all of this and loop back again and continue walking. 
um, there's basically no other way uh, I can walk. So uh, as you can see, uh, a walk always goes along an edge, but it has a certain direction. For example, the, the, the outer walk, when walking this edge, goes that way, while the inner walk goes the other way. Um, that is very interesting. And note that the outer, for example, for this edge, which is a bridge, actually, those are the ones we know that uh, touch the same region on both sides. Uh, that one is walked uh, twice uh, during the the, the only uh, cycle that, that uses that edge. But it uses it one time going that way and the other time going that way. So um, basically for each edge, uh, we will use it twice. Uh, maybe w when it is a bridge, it will be used uh, both ways, basically, because um, both sides will be visited uh, while visiting the, the same region, and, and that region will be defined by its cycle. Um, and for the other regions, well, they touch two different... Uh, for the other edges, sorry, uh, they touch two different regions, and that's why they, they will... Each side will be visited on a different uh, possible cycle. But this is the idea. If you manage to walk and, and, and just simulate uh, walking along uh, these cycles, uh, then you are effectively iterating all the edges on the boundary of a region. And that is uh, enough to calculate um, the dual graph. Just go through all edges and start walking and walk until you look back. When you have walked um, a complete cycle uh, going back, then you have completely um, examined the boundary of a certain region and keep track of that. Basically, all we should need uh, to keep track of that is um, each time that when walking a cycle uh, for a new region, we step on a certain edge. Well, that means that uh, one side of that edge uh, touches the current region. So for example, if this region is each, each time we start a new cycle, uh, we, we, sh we should create a new region. So when, when running the algorithm for this graph, we would create three regions. Let's call them uh, one, two, and three. Let's give them that name. So, um, for example, when visiting, um, when running the cycle for the external region, the one I've labeled one, uh, when going through this edge, I will write down, okay, this edge, I don't know, maybe this is the edge. Uh, each edge should have an ID, a number in, a, in the array of edges. Um, so, but if this is the edge E, well, somewhere it will say edge E, well, it has two sides, side one, side two. And okay, now we can uh, say, okay, one of its sides, uh, we, we can actually, um, um, no, okay, it, th those are the two sides. So um, we can write, okay, one of the sides is touched by uh, the region one, and we keep walking. And we do the same when we see another edge, we write down, okay. We will find at some time, uh, at some point, this edge uh, P, let's, um, yeah, I don't know, P, j just because. There's somewhere else in the right, uh, that edge, and we will write in, okay, uh, that one is touched by the edge one, we keep going, and then we will find it again during the same cycle, but uh, going the other way. So that means, okay, both sides have been touched. Um, so the, the, the check is basically uh, write it down, but if there is already, if you've already seen that edge, then okay, this is the second one. So this makes this edge a loop automatically. Um, but for the other one, it will be found only once. But then when we loop um, through the region two and walk this way, we will find the same edge and, s and write down, oh, okay, uh, side one is already used. So I will write down that side two is used by uh, this edge. And that's basically it. By looping through all and writing down, you end up with, um, for each edge, um, you will have a list that says for each edge which regions, which is basically the number of loop that you run. But you know that you will run exactly one loop, uh, one walk, I mean, for, for each region. So those are the regions. And those, uh, this encodes the, the dual graph in a very, very straightforward way. So, so the loop is similar in, in, a, in some sense to DFS or BFS when you use it to 
compute connected components, only that uh, the possible states of the graph are the edges of the original graph. You are walking the edges, but even though the original graph is uh, undirected, uh, you will put each edge twice because uh, they will be um, basically arrows in the order in which you can um, walk them. Taking into account this handy rule of uh, always walking with uh, thinking that the edges are walls and you're walking with the left uh, hand uh, placed on the wall. Um, so yeah, basically you iterate through all two um, edges and whenever you see an edge that uh, has not been visited um, yet, so uh, you, you would have to, for, for each of these directed edges, you would need a, a Boolean value telling whether it's been visited or not. And whenever you see one that has not been visited, well, just greedy, uh, call, call your greedy function uh, walk and start walking there until you come back exactly to the same edge. You can remember that. You, you don't need to, uh, well, or, or you can check if you've already visited it. That's an implementation detail, but you actually, these are cycles. So you actually know that you will come back to exactly the same place. That might be easier to check. And once you've done that, you will visit all the corresponding edges and write down uh, the corresponding number and then go on um, until you've uh, checked uh, all possible edges and concluded that you've left uh, no possible walk to do um yeah that's all the only tricky uh, th this is no harder than uh, computing a, an euler tour of a graph because an euler uh, the only tricky part is that basically for each edge you have to know if you've uh, gone that way or not and we will uh, soon see that uh, we will need some way to like um when you go through one edge you will like to know uh, the reverse edge uh, I mean, if you're on node V and you find that edge and say, okay, now go to node uh, W, you will like to know, well, in the adjacency list of W, uh, exactly where is um, the the opposite edge, the one that will point uh, backwards from where I, I came. Um, and that is a, an operation that you also usually like when you compute Euler tours. So the code is very similar and it's, it's, not, it's not hard. Um, that, that's the only really tricky part and that uh, and that when you walk when you implement that this greedy walk there okay start walking with the left hand on the wall that is where you use um, the ordering that we mentioned that is where you used the fact that is basically the only place where you actually use that you've ordered the edges um, this way because that is what tell you how uh, where to continue Let's make a very simple drawing. If you are entering, if you are entering a node uh, V from a previous node W, then you've currently just walked uh, this edge from V to W, uh, from W to V. And well, now you would like to know, so you're walking this way because you have the left hand on the wall. So you would like to know what is the next one. And, um, since we are um, working with the left hand on the on the wall, this all assumes that we're looking from above. Of course, uh, when I say left hand, of course, if we were looking from below, then everything would be backwards. But I guess it's more intuitive for everybody to think that we are looking at people walking from above, like from a plane or a helicopter, and not from below, like I don't know, a, a glass floor, and we're looking up. Uh, but well, we're looking for above. I never said it. Um, so yeah, we're working with the left hand on the wall. And and now we have to know when well, there are many possible edges to continue. I might even have to backtrack if there's the only option. Um, but which is the next candidate? Well, from this drawing, it is pretty clear that uh, the next candidate is simply the next, the next one in the cyclic order that we've established uh, because you want precisely that from V, the next one in an anti-clockwise order, which will be this edge. And those, that is the only tricky, uh, no, it's not too hard, you just have to be slightly careful. Um, I mean, it's easy to do in linear time, but you would like to do it uh, quickly. That is why it's useful when you actually create the these lists to, to somewhere um, 
to, to encode the information in, in such a way that um, the, in the same way that you can go to an edge and add where the, the, these are the two um, sides and I write down here, uh, you will likely want to have their information um, about the edge to, uh, so that you can um, easily know what is the position of an edge, of a certain edge uh, in the adjacency list of both of its vertices. Because that way, when you uh, come to node V from node W, from this edge, you can easily check, oh, in the list of V, I, I, I don't know, V has a certain adjacency list, uh, which is ordered cyclically, and I know that somewhere there is W. Where is it? Once you know where is it, it is, well, the next uh, node, maybe it's X, the next node is uh, the one you will want to uh, go now because that implements this uh, left walking. Um, and that's all. Maybe maybe you, you, you can, uh, the implementation will be slower if you just put a set instead of a list and just uh, find the iterator for the, for the vertex and add. And if it's the, the last one, just go to the first one. It will be much slower unnecessarily because you could just have used a, a simple index and have constant time access, but well, it's an option. It works. Uh, that that's the idea. You just have to go to the next one in the cyclic order. That the conceptual it's very simple, and that's it. You keep walking until you would come back to the same edge and then avoid looping, and you will greedily go through the whole region. That's there's no other secret. So the process is it's not hard. Um, a special case that if everything is correctly coded, w everything should just uh, work fine, but maybe you, you want to be careful about it. If this is the only edge going through V, then you will arrive here, you will have W, and then you will ask, well, what is the next one from W? And this is a cyclic list, so this is the only edge, so W is again the, the next one. So that means that you now go from V to W, so you go that way. And of course that means in the in the left uh, wall analogy, this means that you go like this and now uh, come back the other side. That's, that makes a lot of sense. So that's basically it. That's how you you calculate, you compute the dual graph. And, the, and, and all of this takes uh, linear time. Yeah, th this is very similar to DFS, so everything can be done in linear time. That's very efficient. Uh, the only detail is that this is for a connected graph, but almost always, almost always, uh, that's enough. For example, for the max cut problem that we saw before, um, well, we, we can separate the problem into connected components and then basically solve for each connected component. Um, there, there, there's no not not much uh, interest. So. Um, so that's, that's not a, an extra difficulty. Um, the, in, in some problems, um, you actually have a well-defined drawing that is not connected and you care which uh, regions are inside which regions. Well, that problem is much harder and basically would require uh, a careful sweep line approach. It can, it can be done, but it's uh, harder, quite harder. Um, but yeah, it, it, it also can be done. Uh, th that is a code that I would uh, recommend um, someday f coding, uh, like a sweep line that is able to to to, uh, to compute the the dual graph for a general disconnected graph and, and then use it. But the overwhelming, m most of the times I, I've seen this, um, you can just uh, compute something. Either the graph is connected or you can, um, uh, and if it is not connected, then you can basically run the algorithm for each connected component and that's good enough. One example of a very nice uh, problem where this is enough is one from IOI uh, 2007 in Zagreb. This is problem flood and there um, you were given um, basically a graph drawing with the added benefit that um, all the edges were either north, south, or east, west. So only vertical and horizontal uh, edges. And now, like the name says, uh, the idea was that there was a flood coming from the outside. And the situation was that the flood initially um, filled the whole outer region. And then 
those walls that had water on both sides survived because uh, that, that, that's stable. But those that have water on one side and air, no water on the other, immediately collapse. And so on the first step, all of these ones collapse. All of these ones collapse while these two survive. And then we can uh, go inside again and the water fills this region. And then again, all of these ones collapse while this one stands. And the problem asks us to uh, calculate exactly which walls uh, will uh, stand after the flood and which will collapse. Looking at this drawing, one, one might get um, the intuition that we just have to compute bridges because those are the ones that will be standing at the end. But uh, that will be unfortunately uh, wrong. Bridges do stand at the end because logically uh, we already know that a bridge uh, has the same region on both sides. So when the water gets to that region, um, it gets to both sides of the wall at the same time, so it will not collapse. Um, however, however, uh, there are other walls that won't collapse. For example, take this case as an example. Here, this middle wall is not a bridge, um, but it won't collapse nevertheless. First, the, wall, the water will uh, fill all this outside and all of these walls will collapse. And then afterwards, the water will fill both compartments. And then uh, since both are filled at the same time, this wall will not collapse. So basically the condition for collapsing is checking uh, at what distance, if we just calculate on the dual graph, the distance uh, from the outermost region to each of the, um, to each of the regions on each of the sides of, um, of, of a wall, then if those distances are different, the wall will collapse because the water will get first to one side and not the other, and so it will destroy it. But if the distance is the same, then the, the wall will stand out. So basically a single BFS in the dual graph from the outermost region is enough. That would solve the problem. But um, this problem would be com could be complicated because it is not connected. So like I said, oh no, our algorithm for the dual graph only works for the connected case. Uh, we might have something complicated here. But it is easy to check that, okay, we can solve it independently for each connected component and the answer does not change because, okay, even if I take this connected component and analyze it uh, separately, like it was as its own graph, well, the times will be all wrong. I will I will assume okay the, the the outer will will be filled at time zero and the inner one will be filled at time one, while in the real um, case this is filled uh, later because it it is buried uh, inside. Um, but that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. We can we can take uh, this zero to mean well zero is um, whenever. Um, the water gets to this outer part of, of this connected area, which is one in the, in the real life. And from that, we will compute times uh, inside because the only thing that matters is whether um, the two sides of the wall have the same time or not. And so if it is all offset by the same initial amount, it doesn't change. So this is an example of a problem where, okay, if we get to the connected time, that's enough. And um, this is enough to solve the problem in linear time or maybe in long end time because one has to sort or something. But um, yeah, that, that's basically enough. Um, and one last thing to, to end. This is a great example of a case that is much um, much easier to code. It, like I showed, um, computing the dual graph is not that hard actually. It's similar to Euler cycle. So. If you can code Euler cycle, you can perfectly code a dual graph generation, at least for the connected case, which is the, the easy case, um, the good case. The, the, the other one is uh, much harder because it's like a general segment intersection. It's quite similar. Um, okay. Um, but this case is even easier because um, it's very nice because only you only have a north, south, west, east walls. So when you have to represent those uh, cyclic lists, instead of having uh, a normal uh, list, like a vector, an, adja an adjacency list, um, it is much better to have an, an array with four fixed values 
and I don't know, let's say that you take the convention that zero is east, one is um, north, uh, two is west, and three is south. So you will have, for each node, you will have an array telling you in, in each of the four directions which is the next node. So which is the edge, uh, for example, if, if this is V, then the array of V would tell, well, uh, to the east, what is the node? Well, maybe W. To the north, well, I don't know, minus one, maybe you can use to, to say that there is no node that way, that, that's fine. Uh, when a node like this one has no edge going north, okay, you can put minus one in there, right? Um, but otherwise, you, ca you can just uh, write it this way. Um, and this not only al already takes care of the uh, cyclic order, because uh, of course you'll want to order them such that the next one, when you go uh, counterclockwise, is just plus one, modulo four. Um, this also makes the implementation of the walking routine much easier, because when you, when you are, uh, arrive at a node, you can actually keep track of in which direction you're walking. So your state can be, uh, instead of keeping track of the edge itself, um, you can basically think of it like, okay, I am at that, and I am at node V, and I arrived, and I have just arrived at node V, looking, say, north. I've arrived like this. So when you look, if you're looking north, what is the next direction that you should look? Um, well, actually, if you're looking north, it means you came from the south, the opposite, and that means that you have to check the next one, which is east. So maybe whatever is easier, you can encode in which direction you're going or in which direction um, you, you you came from. You'd probably need both, but with this representation, it's easy to, to change because the next one is plus one, modulo four, and the opposite direction is plus two, modulo four. So you can easily convert from one to the other. Um, and so it, it, it is quite easy because you, you greedily check Okay, I arrived north, so I came from the south, so now I must check first the east edge. Is there an east edge? Yes, there is. Okay, that, that's the next one, because it's like coming here and walking like this. If there is no east wall, then the next one. Is the north one there? Is the west one there? And eventually, uh, you, you will not get, get stuck, because if you started with an edge, then eventually, even if none of the other three exists, the fourth one will be the same direction that you came from and, and there you will have uh, an edge. So you will you will be doing like this. Okay, and this is, um, so th this case is especially easier to, to code. So well, when I first uh, saw this problem, I thought, oh, it's super, super hard to implement, but but now after after learning about dual graphs and especially the, this, this trick of using the direction uh, for the adjacency list, which already easily takes care of the circularity in the correct order, um, well, uh, now I find it um, not too hard, uh, probably similar to, to most problems of Euler cycle, that, that would be the, the difficulty. Uh, uh, um, so yeah, that, that's basically all I had uh, for today and I hope you, you liked this lecture.